features. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll go through some of the basic principles, uh, anatomy classification, some of the x-ray findings, uh, the management and some of the controversies. So things like the syndesmosis went to the CT and posterior malleolus, which are all sort of areas of question marks uh, in the uh, trauma meeting. So starting with the anatomy, this is basic stuff, but it's worth just going through it. So we can see that there's, you know, you've got a distal tibia, uh, you've got a fibula, uh, and most importantly, and actually what we're going to refer to a lot today is the medial ligaments, which connect the medial malleolus to the talus, the lateral ligaments that connect the fibula to the talus, and also the syndesmosis, which is the joints between the tibia and the fibula uh, above the ankle joint. And the syndesmosis specifically um, resists axial rotational and translational forces. So it widens slightly during gait. It does externally rotate during gait. And the most important thing is that it's a mobile joint, but actually having the syndesmosis reduced stabilizes the mortis. So this is a diagram of the syndesmosis. And, and actually there's three main components. There's the intraosseous ligament, which is this ligament in the middle. Um, and then you've got the AITFL, which is at the front, and the PITFL, which is at the back. And the PITFL specifically we'll mention later when we talk about the posterior malleolus. But all of these components make up the stability of the syndesmosis. So without these, you can potentially have weakness here, and then you would have to think about fixing them. So this is uh, the classification of most ankle fractures, and this is what everyone talks about in the trauma meeting. So you've got the Weber A, you've got the Weber B, and the Weber C. Now the Weber A is below the level uh, of, the, of the ankle joint, so below the syndesmosis. Uh, and it's all of these fractures here. And most of the time, you never need to fix these. These are something that, these are injuries that will heal well. Weber B is at the level of the syndesmosis. So it's any fracture in this region here. Um, and it is a, a, a fracture that can uh, often be unstable. And we'll talk about stability a little bit later. Um, and then you've got the Weber C fractures, which tend to be always unstable uh, just because of the mechanism and they're the high fibula fractures and they're the ones that you often need to fix. So Lauger Hansen came up with this classification system, which is, which is quite difficult to understand, but actually there's a few simple concepts and I think it's really important that we go through those today. So first of all, if we break everything down into supination and uh, pronation. So the supination injuries tend to have the lower fibular fractures. So that's the first thing to remember, that you're never gonna get a Weber C with a supination adduction or a supination external rotation injury. And then the difference between a supination external rotation and a supination adduction is the type of medial malleolus fracture. So number two on this box in the middle, which is basically the fact that you'll have a vertical type medial malleolus fracture in the supination adduction and a more oblique type in the external rotation type. Now the pronation injuries tend to be most commonly have the high pronation eversion have the high Weber C fractures and the way these work is they 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 tend to cause injury to the medial side first and the syndesmosis is often always injured so it's it's important to note that with pronation type injuries high fibula fractures it's always important that they need to be surgically reduced and you always have to think about syndesmosis instability and often they need to have screws or tight rope to stabilize the syndesmosis and this just sort of goes through the same same concept. The, the diagrams at the top show that there's, you know, this is a pronation, the diagram on the right, sorry, shows the pronation and the pronation adduction. And on the left, so the supination eversion and so supination adduction type injuries. But the most important thing to note, and this comes to stability, is that the whole ring doesn't have to be broken. So actually, if the whole ring isn't broken, then it may still be a stable ankle fracture. Now, things to look for when you're looking at x-rays. So if you look on the left side, you've got an AP x-ray, looking at the overlap of the tibia and the fibula, uh, and looking at equal horizontal and medial clear space. So basically, that should all be relatively equal uh, as you work your way around the mortise. Secondly, um, on the, um, in the middle picture, you've got, um, you've got the, uh, the fibula. So this is a mortise x-ray where you shouldn't see, um, you should see a nice clean uh, ankle mortise. Uh, and you should see a sort of clear space equal throughout the whole area. But you should also always see a distal tibia fibula overlap. And actually, if there isn't an overlap, then most of the time there's a syndesmosis injury. And on the lateral x-ray, which is better seen here, you should be able to see the posterior border of the fibula at the level of the posterior articular surface. And actually, this can give you an idea. Sometimes when you can't see a fracture of a fibula on an AP x-ray, 
if you try and outline the fibula on the lateral, you may actually see the fracture here because they tend to be oblique. Um, so look for these sort of landmarks to check. First of all, intraoperatively, these are landmarks you look at to see if the fibula is reduced, but actually more importantly, when you're diagnosing an ankle fracture, try and use this to see if the fibula is in the right place uh, and if it's broken. So your goals of surgery are anatomical reduction, early weight bearing and stability. Those are your key goals of ankle fracture management. And there's some key things to remember. Obviously, open fractures, you know, you, you treat as per BOST guidance and they have a slightly different management plan most of the time. But also comorbidities may influence your treatment. So things like diabetes, um, especially the poorly controlled diabetics. The, neuro, the people with neuropathy, people with renal disease, you know, first of all, that they're going to need a longer duration in plaster because they don't heal as well and they've got microvascular disease, but also they have a greater risk of complications with your traditional open reduction internal fixation, so greater risk of wound problems, greater risk of non-union and hardware problems. So there's a whole different um, sort of almost thought process that has to go into these patients. And finally, it's really important to ask about their social history. So things like smoking and alcohol use uh, and they may, you know, what their mobility is like will influence your decision making. And don't forget that you know, smoking is key to not just wound healing, but also bony union, especially around the ankle. Um, and if they continue to smoke, they're more likely to have these complications. So this is your sort of unimalleolar fibula fracture, Weber B, stable and undisplaced. And actually, if you look at these um, uh, x-rays in the bottom right, you've got A, B and C. So A is your Weber A, B is your Weber B, which is stable, and C is your Weber C. Um, now, we aren't going to, we are Weber C has a high fibula fracture. We just talked about the fact that the syndesmosis is likely to be injured, so we're going to need to fix that. So this is for the A and Bs. Um, and these, you can generally put into a walking boot early and get them moving early. Now, the question is, and what we sort of referred to earlier, is what is stability? Now, stability is all about the medial column. So it's all about the medial malleolus or the deltoid ligament, or it's the syndesmosis. But most of the time, when we talk about stability in relation to a Weber B fracture, we talk about um, really a relationship with the medial malleolus. And, and the best way to test this is, well, there's two ways to test this. One is the weight-bearing radiographs, which will hopefully show an opening on the medial side. And the second is a, um, uh, trying to examine the medial side of the ankle. Even though this isn't completely bulletproof, it's worth checking if they've got any pain on the, on the medial side. Now, this is an example of what I'm talking about. So you've got the patient on the left, Weber B ankle fracture, no fracture of the medial malleolus, everything looks well aligned, and we're thinking it's quite stable. On the right, you've got a, a Weber B ankle fracture, and you've got an increase in the medial clear space. So on the picture on the right, the patient has clearly got a shift. Now the shift here isn't because of a medial malleolus fracture, but it's because of a rupture of the deltoid ligament. And the deltoid ligament has torn, which is why the talus has shifted, uh, which is why the tibia has shifted on the talus and why it's displaced. And this is in essence, um, uh, the same as a medial malleolus fracture, the whole ring is broken. And, and so we can determine from that that the ankle is unstable. Now on the left side, uh, the medial malleolus is intact. There's a fibula fracture. Um, and we can see that this is a weight-bearing X-ray, so there doesn't appear to be any shift. So it's quite safe to place this patient into a boot. Now, the next question is, when would you get a CT scan? Now, most of the time, you know, when you've got an X-ray and you see a posterior malleolus fracture, it's very important to think about whether or not someone would go in and fix the posterior malleolus. So that's one indication. Syndesmotic injuries are another, and actually these supination adduction types, which you can see on the diagram, where they've got this vertical um, medial malleolus fracture, may lead to impaction of the fapon. And actually, majority of people, and you know, and and studies have shown this, is that they would change their surgical strategy on the basis of a pre-op CT. So it's really important, especially with this trimalleolar fracture, to think about a CT scan because actually you may go and fix the posterior malleolus instead of leaving it alone. Now, the management of ankle fractures is multi-faceted, uh, and actually we'll, we, we don't have time to discuss the ins and outs of this today, but actually generally a fibula is fixed with a lag screw and a plate, either a third tubular or a locking plate. The medial malleolus tends to be fixed with a medial screw, where you can fix it with a hook plate. And the posterior malleolus tends to be fixed with a plate at the back, but also can be fixed with screws. And the syndesmosis can be fixed with a tightrope or screws.
So when you are thinking about fixing an ankle, it's all about thinking about this ring. Uh, and the ring is made up of what's in red, which is the fibula, the blue, which is the syndesmosis, the green, which is the posterior malleolus, and the yellow, which is the medial malleolus, and also sort of the orange, which is the deltoid ligament. So those are the sort of the things you need to think about restoring. And when you are doing an operation, it's very important to get these things right. So fibular length and rotation, getting your medial reduction right, getting your syndesmosis right, uh, and getting your posterior malleolus and articular surface right. And we know that actually malreduction of the ankle causes post-traumatic arthritis, it causes ankle pain, stiffness and instability. And actually all of these, uh, the reason why we sort of go on about getting ankle fractures right is just because actually we see the majority of patients with post-traumatic ankle arthritis are those who've had fractures or trauma. And actually malreduction of the syndesmosis specifically is in anything from up to 52% of cases. So it's really important that you get your ankle syndesmosis fixation right. Two to four centimeters above the profonde and have your screws or tight ropes parallel and angle 30 degrees anterior. Now, fibula reduction is the key. And actually, if you haven't got your fibula right, it's likely to lead to a problem with your syndesmosis. So you can't sort of say, well, the fibula is a bit short, but I'm just gonna get the syndesmosis through the screws. It's just not gonna work. Because the fibula, as you can see here, interacts very, very um, importantly with the syndesmosis and the tibia. So if your fibula is rotated or it's unstable or it's short, it's not gonna be congruent in that syndesmosis. And, and this is an example of this. So this x-ray on the left is one of those that you see in a trauma meeting and you go, oh, that looks okay, next patient. But actually you can see that the fibula doesn't look right. The mortis doesn't look right. It all looks a bit tight and a bit compressed. There isn't much tibia fibula overlap. It all just doesn't look right. And if it doesn't look right, most of the time it's not right. And this is what the CT scan looked like, which was a chapeau tubercle that had come off the front. Um, and you had this uh, instability of the syndesmosis. And one of the problems with putting a screw in when you haven't got your fibula right is that the screw will hold it in a bad position or can actually get the fibula in the wrong position. So if you are worried about your syndesmosis, this is what you do. You make sure that you've got your length restored um, and actually intraoperatively, you can go over the top, um, sort of own your lateral approach, try and feel this area here, which is basically where the AITFL is. And you can feel the front and check if it's reduced. Uh, and this, this is basically an example of what the syndesmosis should look like. And the posterior malleolus is really important when it comes to syndesmotic stability, as we talked about at the beginning of the talk because the PITFL contributes to 40 to 50% of strength of the syndesmosis. So fixing the posterior malleolus restores strength to the syndesmosis. Now the syndesmosis screws, I think, you know, there isn't really the jury's out, three or four cortices, there's no, no difference. Screw diameter makes no difference. Two screws are generally thought to be better and actually two centimeters above the joint line gives less widening. Should we remove screws? Probably not. Actually, there's no justification for a secondary procedure and the outcome supports this. It's better just to leave them in and let them break. But if they are symptomatic, you should go and take them out. Now, what should you use? Should you use a tightrope? Should you use screws? Actually, tightropes have been shown to have better movement, less implant removal rates, better range of movement of the ankle, higher outcome scores, and less widening at two years. So actually, suture buttons have, in, in terms of the evidence, been shown to be better then actually show that there's a higher return to work as well and there are still complications with these for example diastasis irritation of knots and uh, wound problems um, and actually they are more expensive than a single screw especially if we're not removing them so it's worth remembering that when you're putting two tight ropes in and finally just to touch on the posterior malleolus the the sort of the the evolution of this is now now very in vogue that everyone sees a posterior malleolus fracture gets a ct and fixes it and this is an example of this. So this is a, a trimalleolar fracture. You've got a medial malleolus fracture, a fibular fracture, and a posterior malleolus fracture as well. And you get a CT, and the, re, the rationale for fixing this posterior malleolus are these, which is restoring stability of the ankle, re reducing the need for syndesmotic fixation, and improving contact pressure distribution, basically getting your articular surface right. And also, this allows for early range of movement because you've stabilized the aspect of the ankle that may be unstable or cause pain. And it, Mason and Malloy have classified this into various different classes. Number one is where there's a small sliver taken off the back 
this is where you fix it in the traditional syndesmosis way. The two A's and two B's, which are posture lateral or posture lateral, posture medial. And the three, which is basically like a rotational pilon fracture, which is a large fragment. And, you know, there is some evidence about how you should fix these. And, and, and this is not for the purpose of this talk, but it's worth ha having an idea of what these are and how, how they can be managed. And so, and also, you know, if you are going to fix these, you have to think about your approach. You need to think about going through the back or going, uh, and either you can go posture medial or you can go posture lateral. Uh, and, but there are neurovascular structures in the way, and it's worth remembering the anatomy of these when you do these approaches. So just to summarize, uh, anatomical reduction uh, is key um, for ankle fractures. We know that there's, we have to have a low threshold for preoperative CT to help with planning how we're going to fix them. Don't forget the syndesmosis. Don't forget the posterior malleolus, they all need addressing. And actually, if the interoperative x-ray in your trauma meeting looks wrong, it probably is. Thank you. <laughs>